Hello there, and welcome back to the introduction to English linguistics. In this video, I'd like to continue with the topic of historical linguistics, and I'll give you a brief tour, a very brief tour of Old English and Middle English. Now, in the last video, I discussed the idea that languages are related. I presented to you William Jones, and that he observed that Sanskrit, Greek, and Latin were so similar in their words and in their grammatical structures that he thought they must go back to some common source which perhaps no longer exists, and he called that language Proto-Indo-European. Now, Proto-Indo-European indeed does no longer exist, but it is the source language not only of Sanskrit, Greek, and Latin, but also of French and Norwegian and a whole lot of other languages that you know, right? The family tree model of language. I then discussed a sound change that happened between Proto-Indo-European and Proto-Germanic. Um, that's called the First Germanic Sound Shift, or Grimm's Law, a change that affected Proto-Indo-European stop consonants, and uh, that allows us to distinguish the Germanic languages from all the other Indo-European languages. Right, that happened between roughly 2000 to 500 before Christ. Today we're taking a large jump ahead in time. We're talking about this little snippet here of the language tree, uh, the period where English comes into its own, periods of Old English and Middle English. Um, now, in this class, I will distinguish between five different periods of English, uh, starting with Old English, 700 to 1100, um, the language of the famous poem Beowulf, then um, from 1100 to 1450, there is Middle English, the language of Geoffrey Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales. We'll listen to a bit of the Canterbury Tales in a few minutes. From 1450 to 1700, it's Early Modern English, the language of Shakespeare and the King James Bible. From 1700 to 1900, it's Late Modern English, the language of the philosopher David Hume and the novelist Jane Austen. And after that, it's Present Day English, now, which will be preserved in the lyrics of Britney Spears and Justin Bieber. Okay, so why do we distinguish between these five different periods? Well, they correspond to certain sociopolitical cornerstone dates. So with regard to Old English, uh, we can say that around 450, three Germanic tribes arrived on the British Isles, the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. And uh, even though they didn't start speaking Old English right away, you know, that marks the beginning, that lays the foundation of English. For Middle English, the most important date for you to remember is 1066, the Norman Conquest, William the Conqueror, and the Battle of Hastings, causing massive social and linguistic upheaval and thereby marking the beginning of the Middle English period. Right, for Early Modern, we have, well, around 1450. A date that we can pick out is 1476, um, which marks the establishment of the first printing press in Britain. Yeah, you might wonder why printing press? What does that have to do with the development of English? Well, William Caxton, who ran this printing press, was a great philanthropist, interested in works of literature, works of art, but he was also a great businessman, and so he thought he might sell a few more copies of his books if everybody in the country could understand them. Yeah, So he propelled um, a process of standardization um, that marks the beginning of early modern English. Right, late modern, starting around 1700. Um, there is no single date that we can point to, but there are two major social developments going on. Uh, one of them being the Industrial Revolution and the other one being the rise of the British Empire, the rise of British colonialism, chiefly in the Caribbean at that time. So that's how late modern English is contextualized. Present day English, well, if you want to be on the safe side, you can say, okay, everything after World War II is present day. Before that, it might be late modern. Okay, um, with all of this in mind, let's start and talk about Old English. I already mentioned that the birth of English 
now around 450 with the arrival of the Angles, Saxons and Jutes and you can see they came from northern Germany, Denmark. <clears throat> right, and I want to read this little quote to you here, can't resist. Um, both the historical sources and the archaeological evidence seem to agree that the major influx of Germanic immigration into England came in the mid-5th century. Right. Um, the sources refer to a Celtic proud tyrant who invited the Saxons into the country to help his people resist attacks from the barbarian Picts and Scots of the north. This invitation was a gross miscalculation as the Germanic tribes soon turned against their erstwhile employers. Yeah, so there's a life lesson here. Should you ever have trouble with a Scotsman, no, don't bring the Germans in. Bad idea. Okay, um, it's time to listen to some uh, old English. Fadu ura thu the art on hearfenum, si thi nama yahal god, toba kuna thi naricha. Ye wertha thin willa on e othan swa swa on e othanum. Or on e ye dag wam leek an chlaf siula us to dag. An fi ye fus ura yiltas, swa swa we fo ye fath ura yiltendum. An the ye lea thu us on kosnum ye, ac a lusus of e willa, soth leecher. Soth leecher. Right, um... Now, if you want to, you can pause this video here and look at the text in a bit more detail and see how many of the words you can actually figure out without the translation on the other side. You can do that now, but I will continue pointing out a few things about this text. So, you can recognize things like Fader, Hervonum, Thin Name, Thin Rieche, Thin Wille, um, Todag, um, yeah, but then again, there are many words that you can't really figure out, and also the structures of the language seem, well, a bit foreign uh, when we look at it from the perspective of present-day English. Um, let me just point out one specific detail here, namely the little word our in present-day English, our daily loaf, our sins, our debtors, that corresponds to three different words in the Old English original, we might say, yeah, urne ye dach wam likan chlaf, ure yultas urum yultendum. You might wonder, why is that? Why three different words when one obviously is enough? Well, these three different forms mark grammatical distinctions of case and number. Case, nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, uh, number, singular, plural. Yeah, so for instance, in uh, ure yultas, and forgive us our sins, that's accusative plural. Um, as we forgive our debtors, that's dative plural. And indeed, we have ure yultas and urum yultendum. Okay, so word types like pronouns or nouns or adjectives, they show these morphological distinctions for case and number. And that is something that present-day English no longer does, really. I mean, we have he and him in pronouns, but that's about it. Another thing that I would like to point out uh, concerns these two uh, verb forms here. In the modern version we have, and forgive us our sins as we forgive our debtors, the same form for the imperative and the first-person plural, we forgive. But in the Old English, well, there's a difference between the imperative, for if us ure yultas, and the first person plural, uh, we for yifas, yeah, with a different suffix. Okay, so not only nouns, adjectives, and um, pronouns, determiners, differ, but also verbs, and we'll talk about each of these in a little bit of detail. Now, um, Perhaps the most important thing you need to remember about Old English is that it has a rich inflectional morphology. Uh, with regard to nouns, for instance, I mentioned case and number, but uh, Old English nouns also inflect for three German, uh, grammatical genders. Yeah? Um, if you know a bit of German, you know the German multisexual silverware, uh, die Gabel, der Löffel, das Messer, pain in the neck to learn for other people and Old English had it and very reasonably got rid of it eventually. Right, 
Um, but not only that, there are also different declension classes. So um, a noun, if it is in one class, might take uh, certain grammatical gender markers. Uh, if it's in another class, those differ again a little bit. So lots and lots of things to learn for the second language learner. Moving on, um, there is agreement in Old English. Demonstratives and adjectives agree in case, number, and gender within noun they modify. Now, as a speaker of French, you might be very comfortable with the idea that an adjective agrees in gender, for instance, and in number with the head noun. Yeah, no, nothing extraordinary there. But something that might actually surprise you is that, okay, it's also going on in um, demonstratives. So here we have um, C, stan, yeah, that stone, and stone is a masculine noun, and then we have Seo Yifu, the gift with a feminine noun. Um, yeah, and also there are distinctions that concern the number, singular, and plural. So this is really complexity that uh, goes through the entire system. <clears throat> um, corresponding to what I mentioned with regard to the word our, there are different case and number endings depending on the qualities of the head noun. Right, so I've talked about adjectives and nouns and demonstratives. Let me talk a bit about verbs. In Old English, one thing that you have to recognize is the distinction between regular verbs and irregular verbs, also called weak verbs and strong verbs. Um, Regular verbs, weak verbs, are things like walk, walked, walked in present-day English. Strong verbs are things like sing, sang, sung. <clears throat> okay, so weak verbs form their past tense forms and their past participles with the so-called dental suffix, uh, D or T, um, as exemplified here with the ver verb fremann, to perform, to do. The present we form, ich freme, thu fremist, he fremeth, and then for the past tense you need to insert this dental suffix ich fremede, thu fremedest, he fremede, and so on and so forth. Right, that's the simple case. Now let's move on to the more complex case, strong verbs, which form the past tense through ablaut. Now the present tense of these strong verbs works just the same as weak verbs, but in the past tense, well, there are different things going on, namely past tense and past participle forms change the stem vowel, this is called ablaut. Yeah, so we have each singer in the present, but each sung in the past. Uh -uh. Right, um, adjectives. One more thing about adjectives that concerns not just a morphological complexity, but rather a morphosyntactic complexity, because depending on the syntactic function of an adjective, it may behave differently with regard to its morphology. This is called the difference between strong and weak adjective declensions. Uh, the strong adjective declension you find when the adjective is alone, alone with a noun or in predicative function, as in uh, Seekönig is gold. That king is good. There you see no affix on the adjective. Now, if we use a slightly different construction, um, se goda kuning, the good king, an attributive construction, suddenly there's this a there. Yeah? So that's the weak adjective declension, which we find with a demonstrative or possessive and a noun. <clears throat> we don't find it in the same way in the strong. Uh, declension in the predicative construction. Right, um, now I can talk about Old English without talking a bit about Vikings. Yeah? Viking invaders landed on the northeast coast of England. Um, they were different Scandinavian tribes speaking Old Norse, yeah? so no North Germanic dialect, and um, many of them actually stayed. Yeah? So they stayed for a good chunk of time, uh, leading to a scenario of language contact that significantly shaped English grammar and also English lexis. That's what I want to talk about for a little bit. You can actually tell where the Vikings were staying if you have a good look at, an, at a map, 
and just look at the names for towns and cities. So here we have Harrogate, Selby, Scunthorpe, and Grimsby. If you take your Google Maps and zoom in further, you discover a whole lot more Bees and Thorpes and Twaits and Thorpes and Tofts and Kirks and so on and so forth. And guess what? Uh, these were founded by people speaking Old Norse and wanted to talk about their churches, their villages, their uh, streets, their entrances, and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, not only do we have uh, Nordic lexical influence in town names, we also have it in the average day-to-day -day vocabulary. Um, a telltale sign is the sk um, onset there, skull, skin, sky, skirt, scream, all of those are Old Norse and quite often they lead to doublings, yeah? uh, similar words, synonyms like craft and skill, hide and skin, yeah? mean roughly the same thing uh, but you have the Old Norse sk word in one and an Anglo-Saxon uh, word in the other, ill and sick wrath and anger. Yeah, certain doublets between Anglo-Saxon and Old Norse. Right, um, that's about it um, for Old English. There's a whole lot more to say about Old English, but I need to move on. And so I want to say a few things about Middle English. And, um, well, what better way to start than with William the Conqueror. That, I think this picture has this thing where you, you know, the, the eyes follow you a bit. It's creepy. Um, right, so uh, let me play you a little bit of Middle English. So then the people want to go on a pilgrimage. Again, you can pause this video here and look at the text in a bit more detail. Um, but I think it's quite obvious that this is much easier to read for a modern speaker than the old English text that we had just a few minutes ago. So a lot of things have happened between Old English and Middle English, and I want to talk about a few of these changes. Uh, chiefly, this concerns the loss of inflections. Yeah? So Old English, you remember, was a highly inflectional language in nouns and in verbs. We had agreement marking on adjectives and demonstratives. So all of that <clears throat> is dramatically reduced. <clears throat> During Middle English, uh, we have a massive disappearance of endings, uh, most of them being unstressed yeah so and in a situation of language contact it's these unstressed things that second language learners have trouble with and that they probably don't pick up as the first thing that they learn and so there's a possibility for these things to disappear let me give you a few concrete examples um, starting with the loss of grammatical gender in adjective inflections uh, in Old English, we have a difference between masculine and feminine. Say in the se ealda man, the old man, there's an a. And in seo ealde talu, the old tale, talu, feminine noun, there's an e. In Middle English, this has already lost a little bit of complexity in that the, um, old, uh, the, the Old English masculine ending, the A, ah, has assimilated to an E, the feminine form. Yeah? The old, the old man, the old tal. <clears throat> and from there, you can imagine how the story continues. The E is being less and less pronounced, 
and in the end the speaker start to drop it you know, every now and then but in the long run the whole thing just gets lost another story of a loss is the loss of final inflectional ends across different grammatical categories for instance we see a loss of n in first person possessive uh, pronouns so mean father turns to me father in middle english and well it's my father in present day english same thing in the infinitive suffix old english ridan um, turns into middle english reden and then modern english gets rid of the nasal altogether and uh, changes the vowel to ride that i'll talk about in the next video right there are certain effects of morphological simplification if a language loses a lot of its morphological complexity a lot of its morphological markers that um, well that usually brings with itself I want to be careful not to say that causes yeah that usually brings with itself certain replacing strategies for instance um, say that some case endings got lost in old English we had thus hundus yeah, of the dog and in uh, the dative it would be them hunde to the dog now in present-day English there's just dog without any case endings and if we want to distinguish whether something was off the dog or to the dog we have to use a preposition to make that same distinction yeah we still have the same ideas like the people back in the anglo-saxon days but we express them in a way that is different not with inflectional endings but rather with independent elements second um, with the loss of morphological categories comes a change in the marking of grammatical relations um, grammatical relations in a nutshell that means who did what to whom subject and object that kind of thing and uh, you can imagine if you have a language that marks subject and object by means of case endings then you are relatively flexible in the positioning of these expressions because the morphological ending will show whether something is the subject or the object. So people in Anglo-Saxon times were free to say Seekönig meteth Thone Bishop, yeah, the king meets the bishop, or Thone Bishop meteth Seekönig. Um, I can switch the bishop and the king around, but it's still clear which one is the subject and which, which one is the object. The grammatical relations are marked on both the determiner and the noun. <clears throat> leading to relatively flexible word order. Now, if those distinctions in the determiner and in the case affixes disappear, then I'm no longer sure whether the dog bit the mailman or the mailman bit, in fact, uh, the dog. So um, I need to make this clear through fixed word order. So indeed, um, Middle English shows a gradual fixation of word order there are empirical studies that deal with this um, uh, rise of subject verb object word order from the year 1000 to the year 1500 okay um, now we also need to talk a little bit about vocabulary yeah uh, the Norman conquest brought with it a large wave of Norman French vocabulary and um, well, <clears throat> um, largely in a distinct number of lexical domains like for instance administration whereas like crown state empire rom reign royal tax parliament subsidy office treasurer peasant slave servant um, yeah they're Norman French they're not Anglo-Saxon Germanic stems Jurisdiction, felony, arson, fraud, estate, bounds, property, just, innocent. Um, and also domestic life, gown, robe, collar, dinner, supper, feast, beef and pork, and so on and so forth. Okay, um, I feel that I should probably stop here, so let me give you a very brief summary. Uh, we've been talking about 
two periods of English, the Old English period, 700 to 1100, and the Middle English period, 1100 to 1450. And what I would like you to remember when you read up on these things is uh, the Old English characteristics of a rich inflectional uh, morphology in nouns and adjectives, the distinction between weak and strong verbs, the distinction between weak and strong adjective inflections, and uh, the lexical influence from Old Norse. Something that I have disregarded in this video is the grammatical influence from Old Norse. Also about that you could say a whole lot. Then Middle English. Um, <clears throat> chiefly I've been talking about the reduction of morphological complexity uh, and the attendant rise of analytic expressions uh, and fixed word order. And I've also mentioned the lexical influence from Norman French. All right, we'll continue uh, with historical linguistics in the next video, and there I'll talk about changes that happened between Middle English and then early modern, uh, late modern, and we'll move a bit into present day English as well. All right, that's it for today. Thanks for watching.